All right, so hello everyone. I am Dawn Schultz. I am the executive director for the U.S. Hemp Building Association. And um, I'm here today to talk about the future of hemp. My background is in accounting, finance, and um, business administration. So when I'm talking about the future, I typically will start with the idea of strategy, purpose, mission, vision. And in the hemp industry, you know, as with any um, corp corporate entity, I've worked in across various in industries at a controller level, including um, corporate farming, investment consulting, edu uh, alter alternative education. Um, the first question I always ask is why? You know, what are we doing this? Why are we here? And what is the impact that we're going to make? And in the future of the hemp industry, um, this is just one statistic that will really hit on what, since I, I started in hemp about three and a half years ago, and uh, the benefit of this plant is that it can create new economies in conjunction with um, helping the environment remediation and restoration. So as far as vision and mission, I'll refer back to the Emperor Wears No Clothes, which is known as the hemp Bible of um, the hemp industry written by Jack Hare. Um, in 1989, uh, Jack, approached the U.S. Department of Agriculture regarding reducing greenhouse, the greenhouse effect um, with a plan to use hemp for that process. And of course, it wasn't legal at that time. So there was, it was not um, something that was made possible, but it is uh, 31 years later, we are two years into legalization of hemp. And now we finally do have the opportunity to really um, implement as Jack's uh, famous saying is, I, I don't know if hemp can save the world, but it's the only thing that can. That really only becomes um, an effective business. You know, it can sound utopian or idealistic unless you really apply it to effective business strategy and models that are financially viable that can um, produce profits and uh, re attract investments. So this is a slide which shows, um, you know, many of the different uses that we can uh, apply to hemp in the industrial applications. So um, most of this is, uh, a lot of my slides are not going to be um, statistic oriented. I'm just here to do kind of a high level overview of the hemp industry. Um, some people say that, that we really won't even call it a hemp industry, that hemp will be a feedstock as a, a material into these other industries as far as textiles and clothing and the um, paper industry, uh, hemp seed oil, nutrition, that type of thing. So, um, but as we're developing uh, all of this right now, you know, they say 25,000, 50,000 uses of hemp, but we're probably only looking at maybe a hundred at this point when you're talking about manufacturing. But in order to move forward with that, we are going to have to develop um, the infrastructure. It, hemp is an emerging market. We are go going to have early adopters that, and uh, in order to really produce uh, manufacturing production at scale, we are gonna have to have massive scale production of growing as well. Um, a lot of research and collaboration research uh, we do here. I'm from the Chicago area and we do have a research collaboration between universities here in the Midwest, um, University of Madison, University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, there's the University in Illinois, Purdue out of Indiana, and um, a University of Michigan that are working together to um, put together all of the numbers that this is their first year doing the research and they're really looking at a lot of interesting data, including um, soil research all the way through, you know, different types of growing, uh, biodynamic, uh, organic, they're really hitting all types of subjects and they're really focusing at this point on CBD, but including fiber, there's been a lot of fiber research plots grown in the Midwest here um, over the summer. And uh, we've also connected them with, you know, Kelly uh, Flynn from Clemson University, who's in charge of the, who's leading the alternative crop yeah, research in that cool. area, Jim. I'm, I'm talking. And um, so they really are looking to expand that, expand that program for research to a national level. So anybody who's interested in participating on that, in that collaboration, please contact me and I can connect you in. Or if you just uh, Google hemp, Midwestern Hemp Database, you can get some more information on that. But 
you know, we, we do really need to, um, you know, a lot of hemp companies that are startup now are really doing vertical integration to make sure that their financial models are viable throughout the supply chain as um, they're developing their models. But strategic partnerships for those who don't have the skills or, or the, the resources to really work throughout the entire supply chain are really going to be key, as well as innovation. And we do have a lot of um, models and machinery and equipment and growing techniques and strategic uh, and um, everything across the board that we can reference from across these, particularly as far as processing goes and the industrial applications. But we are the United States of America, right? We have innovation here. And um, you know, there's some really interesting equipment, even out of Montana, that does some um, scanning of the, uh, you know, of these different types of herds and there's a, so there's a lot of in, innovation in the market right now that will really um, give us the opportunity to move forward with uh, developing the infrastructure. And as we do develop the, the infrastructure, um, we really, in the context of uh, developing systems that work, have the opportunity to, as Dion was saying, you know, it, it really is about the future of our kids and our systems right now are not really working particularly our, for our farmers as far as the Equitable, equitable distribution along the supply chain of the wealth that we're creating. So as we're working in to, to implement these infrastructures, um, it's really important that we're focusing on sustainable, local, regenerative, transparent supply chains, and potentially regional micro models. Um, as you heard Susan Moore speak earlier, uh, it, it is about a hundred mile range in a, a fiber processing, fiber and grain processing is what they want the farmers to be in. So. Some people are of the opinion that uh, co farmer co-ops will be the answer. Some people are of the opinion that the processors will really need to be involved at that uh, level. But I think everyone agrees, as we've already talked about, that the end markets really are the, the most important key in that process is we really need to know what the end markets are. And you know, some people do say that there's, as Susan said earlier, there's a lot of demand for the fiber in the herd. And we really do need to, um, keep in mind full plant utilization as we're developing infrastructures too, so that farmers do have multiple revenue streams as they're growing the crops. So, uh, you know, as we're, as we're developing infrastructures and, you know, these, this is expected to be a trillion dollar industry and um, hemp construction is what the USHBA is focused on and that is expected to be the largest segment of the hemp industry as it's developed. So we really do just need to keep our um, business models and keep in mind our, uh, our clients do not come first, our employees do. So, you know, as we're seeing so many people unemployed and, um, you know, especially in, in our farming communities and so many diff diff difficulties that people are working with in this COVID pandemic situation and mental health and physical health. And, you know, we really do have the opportunity at this point to develop business models that really do incorporate the idea of profit sharing, employee profit sharing, um, employee benefits that really support the employees. Uh, the employees and the workers are the ones that will be doing the work that is going to create the wealth as we develop these industries. So we really do need to incorporate that, those concepts into our um, business models, as well as really keeping an eye on the idea of regenerative agriculture um, and this particular statistic is um, indicating that uh, hemp has the ability to capture 4.1 times the carbon that uh, a tree can. And as we all know, um, in the farming industry or in the farming community, um, we are losing our topsoil and we do have issues with, of, of course, up here in the Midwest, we're in the corn belts, corn and soy, and a lot of chem chemical inputs that um, really do damage to the microbials. So, you know, we really do have um, the opportunity right now to develop new agricultural models that incorporate ecosystems and, you know, not, uh, you know, leaving our ecosystems in place. I, I come from a, um, my most recent position was five years at, on a leadership team in a corporate farm in Southern Wisconsin, where we grew native uh, seeds, seeds and plugs for um, native wildflowers and grasses. So 
our company was all about ecolog ecological restoration, particularly of stream, bank stream banks and waterways. So, um, you know, turning our wetlands and converting our wetlands into farming land and deforestation here in the Midwest, you won't find, you know, every inch of land is turned into farmland and it, it doesn't promote um, good environmental practices. So we, we really do have the um, opportunity right now to develop new agricultural models that really do uh, incorporate um, ecological environmental practices in into our farming processes. And certainly with a focus on soil and environmental remediation and restoration. So we, you know, have so much opportunity with, um, you know, there's Kiss the Ground is a, a great um, documentary regarding this issue and Rodale Institute obviously has a lot of information on this as well. And, you know, really paying attention to the uh, microbial balance in the soil and how that impacts human health and um, the health of our waterways and the phosphorus runoff, you know, the, the reduction of chemical inputs is something that we can really keep our eye on if we're, um, if we're incorporating uh, the ecosystem uh, perspective within our agricultural models as we develop. So I will second what Dion also said earlier regarding education and the future of the hemp industry. Uh, we, like I said, the USHBA is focused on construction, hemp tree construction, which is not, um, there's not a lot of awareness out there about hemp tree construction and uh, to be able to take that to scale, we will um, need to engage on a commercial scale with commercial builders, which is going to um, require commercial, again, commodi commoditizing this crop and being able to move it through processing centers. Um, so it's going to be a huge undertaking. And, you know, we do have a, a lot of connections throughout the U.S. with uh, different processors already. And um, the U.S. HVA, our our mission is um, to support and advocate for the hemp building professionals, hemp building projects and hemp building materials in the US. And one of our main priorities at this point is um, the certification for, for building material specifications as well as for the um, implementation of building codes here in the United States. And in order to facil facilitate that, you know, these are a couple of pictures of commercial projects um, outside of our country so that we can see what, what our goal is. You'll see most, um, a lot of hempcrete projects that you'll see documentation on here in the US are really just smaller projects, um, even, you know, just small outdoor one man, you know, one person type of facilities that, that we're doing research on. But um, this is what we're looking at developing. So this is the market that we have our eye on. And in order to do that, we are going to have to have um, materials specifications in place as well as um, building codes. So uh, right now the, uh, the USHBA is um, collaborating with different organizations across the world and particularly in the US and uh, working with the ASTM to be able to establish the, the materials specifications, which are focused on our value and load bearing fire testing so that we can facilitate um, commercial construction, which again is where we'll be able to um, have the most impact to be able to grow in, in the hemp industry. Um, and this, this is just a little bit more information regarding um, the process that we'll have in order to get to the building codes and what the costs are gonna be. Again, we are collaborating with different organizations across the, the country and looking, have our eye on fundraising as soon as we really can identify what exactly um, each different type of building system does require uh, a different um, process and different testing. And uh, so we are looking, you know, 18 to 36 months, the, the process has been going fairly quickly, but um, it is definitely a process and it is a very important process as you can, um, as everyone's aware, as all of our Western, you know, all, many of our states in the West are now on fire and the consequences of what that, what's happening in that situation. And 
the devastation, the, the environmental and the uh, economic devastation. So we do have um, a lot of expertise on our board at the US HBA. This um, particular article does feature Deanne Mar Mark Graff, who is the vice president of our organization and has worked in the hemp industry as one of the like leading pioneers. And there, this is a great article if you wanna go back and read. No one is suggesting that you would stay in a hempcrete building during a, a fire, but the buildings are, um, hempcrete is fireproof and uh, can save lives by eliminating the need for firefighters to have to go into these areas to uh, save the structures because the structures will survive the fires. And, and on a, from an environmental perspective, uh, you know, hemp, obviously does draw down carbon into the soil. It rebuilds the soil, it's very regenerative. It also hold, holds the carbon in the hemp when you build a hempcrete structure. Um, there are so many different uh, environmental benefits of growing hemp and using it in, in all of our industries, like I said, as a material input. So the future of the hemp industry, um, you know, if we go back to Jack Hare and the, the Fundamental um, activist of the hemp and cannabis industry is really based on human rights and justice and um, including social, economic, environmental and youth um, justice and human rights is really important in, as we develop these industries again. In this COVID-19, 40 million people unemployed, um, increased rates of child abuse, uh, domestic violence, um, you know, we could go on <laughs> for a while about the, the difficulties that people are having in our society and hemp really does hold a lot of the solutions to many of these issues. So we really do have a responsibility in, in the hemp industry as we're developing it to um, look at the systems that are not working for our children. I have a 17 year old and even before COVID, I can tell you that she already was well aware as many of her friends that uh, a lot of the systems that are in place right now are really stressed and w weren't providing much of a, a future. And now we see our kids out of school and at home. And, um, you know, but it, it, in the hemp industry, we're, we're really fortunate to have the opportunity to be able to build these infrastructures and be able to um, create new economies and, and offer some uh, hope for the future of our kids and um, that is one of our sayings at the USHBA is hemp is hope. Um, hemp is uh, one of the most renewable materials uh, on the planet, if not the most renewable. And uh, we really do need to start making conscious decisions about what we're using and the systems that we're developing in our um, production and in our manufacturing and in our industrial processes. And we really do um, have the opportunity right now to develop these systems with renewable materials that will, uh, that could be the answer to a carbon negative society that, that can really help the future of our kids, both economic and environmentally. So um, as you're out there in the hemp industry, as all of us are, I'm sure every day you find people who are struggling and um, I just encourage everybody to be the person that reaches out and gives them hope and brings them into the hemp industry um, where we need people from every level as we're developing this industrial side to be able to, you know, clerical, professional, accounting, legal, I mean, every single aspect and every single um, profession need, will, will need to build this industry together. And uh, if you have any questions about the USHBA, you can uh, reach me at info at ushba.org. And um, we're always looking for new people to collaborate and to connect with. That's, you know, we're a new organization, only about a year and a half old. We have a lot of members that um, across the, the country and across the world that can really um, have a lot of experience in, in the hemp industry, um, in processing and growing and in genetics and, and throughout every section of the supply chain. Even though we are focused on construction, in order to develop that construction at a commercial scale, scale we do keep our eye across the entire supply chain. So if you have any questions about um, how to get involved or uh, fiber research or fiber uh, processing, any type of fiber equipment, 
anything and we can we can connect you into the right areas and help you out so please reach out so so don i'm going to ask you a question because this is a question that came in earlier uh, mm -hmm. the question somebody asked was where do you access these uh, seed for fiber production um, and I mean, I have my own answers and I typed an answer back to that, but I thought I would see what your response to that question is. Well, you know, I mean, that's, it's very, um, it's a very new market, right? So you can get fiber seeds from, you know, a lot of different seed providers, but I think in the long term, what, what, if you ask processors, uh, if you're looking at end markets, you're going to have different specifications on the herd or fiber, whatever the specs are going to be will certainly dictate what the um, varieties are that you're going to need to grow. And certainly the region that you're in also will, um, you know, when I was saying micro models and regional developments here in the Midwest, uh, Wisconsin is historically was the leading fiber state. So uh, we'll be growing fiber in Wisconsin. But if you have, uh, well, I would encourage that anyway. We, we're, it's still very CBD oriented even there. But the, what the, the answer to that is that, you know, some say that it will be the processors once we get those in place that will be able to give you the best resource for seed because they'll know what varieties that they need to have grown to be able to process to meet the specs for whatever the market is on the other side. Yeah, so I, th I think there are a lot of questions about how all of this comes together and you know, envision probably very different or somewhat different markets from one part of the country to the other. Right. The Southeast has a history of um, uh, textile production. So you might right. expect to see more uh, hemp varieties that have a finer uh, and, and better vast fiber quality, whereas other places it may just be the, the herd that fits that hemp creep market or something like that. Um, exactly. Yeah. And that's the point of the micro models. You have a tobacco industry and textile, though, those were your economies. So, you know, you look what you have in your regions, you know, in the grain belts, they have grain processing, so they'll probably grow grain. And, you know, there's different spec specifications that you'll get from different types of varieties. If you're doing a dual crop versus strictly fiber versus, you know, even, um, the cannabinoid plants are able to be processed. It's not extremely economically viable at this point, but it could be in the future as we scale.